Um, so see, I think the first and the most important thing is to work with your own technique as a performer. Because um, if you're unable to first understand what you want to emote, then you will never be able to reach to the audience. So I think the step number one is to really sit back and work on what is the story? What do you want to emote from it? Who, from it, who are the characters? And um, what is the what is the crux of that story that you want to present? Secondly, as I always say, you know, uh, Biju Maharaj used to always uh, give this example that people sometimes say that Indian classical dance, we don't understand anything. And then he used to laugh and say, then I uh, understand in other styles. So uh, th this, this kind of statement uh, stayed with me and I think that as an audience member, there are so many aspects of different art forms that we don't understand because we don't understand the technique of it. But art, art is about that, right? That in spite of not knowing the exact vocabulary of each other, and sometimes that happens even with languages, when you go to a certain country and you are unable to uh, talk a certain language, you still do communicate, right? And the communication does become successful. So. Um, as a performer, while I while I think about how do I ensure to do that, I first sit back and think about what exactly do I want to tell the audience. And my second way of uh, trying, I mean, of course, it is a, is a, it's like a trial, is to try and see to it that I become one with the emotion myself. Because once I do that. I will be able to definitely uh, translate that to the audience. Even if the audience does not understand a word-to-word -word meaning, they will get a gist of what exactly the story is about. Thank you, Romy, for your question. Um, so I would like to talk from a point of reading and discussions that I have been engaging myself with. This comes from there. Um, so there has been a paradigm shift in actually uh, the way we see dancing that was back then and what we see today. Uh, basically in the structure and in the content, I would say. So, you know, uh, back then, um, the erotic element of dance was celebrated. Women being openly talking about uh, their sexuality, etc. That is, I'm talking about pre-British because when, uh, during the British rule, it, it did collapse in a very uh, bad way. I'm sure uh, if you engage yourself in history of dance a little more, you will be able to understand that a lot of sentiments were broken uh, by the British, the Indian sentiments uh, held by hereditary uh, practitioners. So back then, the Shringara element or the erotic element in dance was celebrated. Women could openly come out and uh, dance pieces that uh, spoke a lot on Shringara. So there is a shift in content now, post-independence, where bhakti also was uh, in included. And, uh, and I won't say bhakti wasn't performed back then, but that's the difference I see that there is Shringara element not celebrated as it was done back then. And also with respect to um, structure, you know, um, Bharatanatyam seems very geometrical today. Okay, you can't really go back and see who is the one who got geometry into the form. You know, it had, it had, it had a flow and somewhere it did change. But then uh, the audience, must, today's audience somewhere um, are so inclined towards one kind of dancing that it takes time for them to be able to uh, love the older aesthetic there are performers of the hereditary community who are still dancing, but you know, um, there, is, there is no audience for them. That's a little uh, disappointing because uh, people are so, people have seen a lot of uh, Bharatanatyam that has been happening for a few decades now that they are unable to uh, enjoy the aesthetic that was prevalent in the hereditary dancers' body. Um, so, I think it's important to understand that the, the change of platform is twofold, right? One is that the intent of the performance itself has changed. 
um, and the space in which it's performed has or, changed. You know, I mean, there are so many different ways of, of, of like looking at what has changed. It is a completely different thing. So when uh, Preeti is talking about Sadhir turning into what you see on stage today, I, I don't think that the Odyssey we are performing today looks like what the Mahari dancers did in the temples. It's anybody's guess, right? So I can start by telling you, oh, there was Odyssey sculptures in first century BC, jet caves in Odisha. But the Odyssey that you watch today is post-colonial restructured Odyssey, which is what, 85 years old tops, right? Um, so the intent has changed, the space has changed, the structure has changed. Um, you can also say that the storytelling has changed because we are different and because our world is different and our history is different and what people want to talk about is different, what people already know is different, you know. But I think there's a constant attempt to go back to text, to go back to traditional communities, to go back to what that means, you know, to call it Sadir or Mahari or Kotipua uh, or whatever, you know, the precursors of these dance forms. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of work being done to grapple with what these definitions are. Um, but I think to me, it's the intent that has changed. That's the biggest thing. We have moved out of temples and courts into proscenium stage. And now we have moved off of proscenium stage and onto our laptop screens. Um, and at every change, we are having to learn how to use it better. I'm having to learn to hold my flute here and not here so that it's not <laughs> off, you know. I know it sounds like a really small thing, but it's a mental adjustment that needs to be made because the platform is different and how you're watching me is different. Um, and if you don't learn how to adapt to this change of space and platform and whatever your art forms will die, you have to figure out how to work within these changes. And it's just part of art. It's part of anything. It's part of language, it's part of business, technology, anything. You have to change and adapt and grow and survive. Uh, yeah, Nirupama. So, uh, yeah, it is definitely very challenging because your body is, your muscles are trained in a way that you naturally uh, play support because you're doing a certain movement. So that does happen to me many times. In fact, you must have observed in Banamika, uh, I do this setup piece. And uh, it's very tough for me to control my legs because uh, it just just happens to start tapping and you know, and it's involuntary because I can't do anything about it. It's so ingrained and so practiced that uh, it happens completely out of my control. But having said that, the beauty of the aspect is also that um, how much can you restrict your body but at the same time open it? You know, so this kind of um, dual challenge uh, helps me in terms of uh, getting uh, more internal with what I am doing rather than having to explore that whole space. say that necessity is the mother of the invention because even in Anamika I didn't ask her to do better okay she went and hurt her ankle and we didn't have a choice and <laughs> she just had to not ankle knee something yeah um, and for me also I feel like I would never have thought of doing better until the lockdown presented this big situation and I had to dance in front of a camera and I was like I will just place this much of myself but um, I feel like new situations lead to new possibilities and you just have to find new things to do and um, it was fun. I don't know, I mean, Bendak is a very traditional part of Kathak. Um, for Odyssey dancers, I think it's something that we are uh, we're sort of inheriting and trying and uh, I've, I've done a little bit of it over the last few months. Uh, I don't know if I do a whole performance that way, but it's, it's very interesting, you know, because you kind of figure out which because you have your body's true story tell, right? So if you take away part of it, um, what happens to the recognizability of the art form itself? Um, what tools do you suddenly not have, and what you have to use more in other parts of your body? Um, it's 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 a, it's for me. I think it's a very interesting experiment. I'm not at a place right now where I think I'd put it on stage, but uh, but for this platform, it has been something that I've enjoyed.
uh, this is something that I have really struggled with, especially over the last few years with, you know, the kind of realities we are living in in this country and the reactions that people have to, to religious content, for lack of a better phrase. I think for me, I was also not raised to be overtly religious, but given the roots of the dance form that I have spent so much time practicing, the literature that you have to read, the prayers that are part of the dance forms you do, the minute you touch the floor to start, you do a Bhumi Pranam, you have engaged with Hinduism, whether you like it or not. Um, I don't believe in exclusivity. I don't think that you have to be Hindu to do a Hindu dance form. I don't believe that at all. But I do believe that you need to understand it and you need to engage with it. Um, I actually was speaking at a conference in Singapore last year, last year, year before that, uh, some time ago. Um, and I was interacting with some very committed, very beautiful Bharatanatyam dancers who happen to be Indonesian. So they're all mus Muslims. And one of them was talking very passionately about his relationship with Bharatanatyam and how it has confused his relationship with Islam. Um, and it was something that disturbed me greatly because I was like, why? Why is it so difficult for things for it to coexist and why is it a source of so much trauma for this dancer? Right? And you find that little, little changes to tradition are made to accommodate the, these contradictions. Right? So you will find that these Muslim practitioners of Bharatanatyam, by the way, they are beautiful dancers. They are really not half-assing it at all. They are, they are very committed, very hardworking, beautiful dancers. But you'll find that they will not do Bhumi Pranam. They will not touch their dancers, their Guru's feet. Because I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, of course, I, I don't have great understanding of Islam. But I think from what I understood from what he said, they don't embody God into physical objects. So the minute you have taken blessings from the earth, it's, an, it's a non-Islamic idea. So they have replaced the Bhumi Pranam with a different gesture. And they will sort of take the Guru's hand and place it against the forehead rather than, you know, uh, imply that there is divinity in this human being. And I found that to be, I spent a lot of time thinking about this because you've changed something very fundamental about a, a traditional practice and you have uh, sort of adjusted it to imbibe into another culture, into another religion, you know. Um, so this relationship is something that... I have grappled with a lot because I'm not suggesting this is right or wrong, but you can kind of imagine a point of time when the changes have been made so much and it's been absorbed into so many different cultures that at some point is it going to stop being recognizable? You know, at, at which point does that start happening? That is something that I've really struggled with. In terms of my own personal beliefs, I don't, I, I, I have a hard time uh, justifying what I do for a living in contradiction to like just the, the very depressing narratives that surround religion in our lives today. And I think that I just get angry with, you know, the, the kind of people who have become spokespersons for our religion. This is not scholarship and it's not compassion and it's not that like you don't get to decide um, that this is Hinduism, you know. Um, I have really struggled with that because it makes me really sad and, it, and I feel like um, I have to slightly be apologetic for calling myself a Hindu or, or saying that I practice a, you know, a, a deeply spiritual art form and that I have to sort of be apologist about it and say, oh, no, no, but that's not what it meant. It actually was this, you know, because of the associations with certain characters or certain philosophies or certain texts. And I have found myself tiptoeing around that a lot and I hate it. I, I find that that has disturbed me a lot as a, as a dancer um, because my relationship with my religion is my relationship with dance. For me, it is not different. I did not, I was not raised to consider myself Hindu because of, you know, certain things we ate or did or places we went. Like, it was not like that. My relationship with Hinduism was through dance because I was trying to understand the literature or I was trying to understand these characters I was playing. How is Shiva different from Vishnu? You can't answer that question if you don't understand how Shaivites are different from Vaishnavites or how the temples were different or how the rituals were different. And you can't, you have to engage, right? And what I have enjoyed as an artist is that these art forms are simply telling stories for communities who want their stories to and that is such a beautiful thing. And you, if you can remove compulsion and competition and superiority from these things, it's beautiful. 
and there are parts of this country actually in Kathak where you find that religions have overlapped and learned from each other and you know there was no fear of that but now we're living in a country where someone will come up on stage and say you can't dance to Amir Khusro because somebody important is coming you know I mean it's it's very depressing and it's got nothing to do with faith or spirituality and it's something that has it has disturbed me greatly uh, I'm sorry so I concur a lot with what both of them said. So I wanted to share three instances, okay? Um, so of course, uh, some of us are engaging in the pedagogy of Bharatanatyam, you know? How do we say things to our students who come from different faiths? How are we, so this is something that is important uh, in order to communicate with your student without imposing things that have probably been uh, in line with the training of this form. Uh, and the presentation of it. So I, uh, when I teach the Bhumi Pranam, so I don't ask them where they come from, etc. So I just tell them it's a form of prayer. You pray in a way you feel comfortable. You don't feel like touching the floor to pray. It's okay. But just say a prayer because you're beginning something. If you, I mean, most of them I see believe in some sort of prayer. See, even if they don't, it can be anything. It can be they are talking to themselves, anything. So I have, I had some students who say, no, they don't even believe in prayer. So I'm thinking how I can communicate to them without even bringing any other fabric, you know. So I've started looking at the Bhumi Pranam, which we do before and after a class or a performance, to just say that, take some moment with yourself, you know. It, it can be whatever it is. So I... That matters. And some people would like to know, no, how is it done? Can you tell us? Some people come ahead and ask. So that time, okay, I tell them, this is how I have been trained and I'm telling it to you. So, I, But I keep it open. Because the moment you say, this is the way to do Bhumi Pranam, that is where it slowly starts getting complicated. So of course, uh, it by engaging in classes, you start understanding how to communicate about things that were not questionable for a many, I mean, these questions were not entertained for a very long time. And now as teachers, we let people question us so that we are, we are able to come up with answers that convince us and them. <laughs> because we are all struggling with this question, even as performers and... Uh, well, you know what? Um, I have gone through this turmoil since quite many years now that, you know, uh, there is, on one hand, there are traditionalists who want to keep the tradition so tightly in their hand that they want, don't want to experiment. On the other side, there are beautiful experiments where people are still not messing with the form, but there is a lot more coming and very, very beautiful uh, aspects emerging out of that. And then there is one uh, part where the form, the technique and everything is just taken for granted and is used at ransom to, on the name of experimentation. So, um, I personally have come to this um, this inference that think about it as what is coming from from an instinct when you look up look at a performance. Does that performance really appeal to you? Is it making you feel like, oh wow, how did how was this created? Like what happened? Like how did this this come up? Or were you engaged to see like, oh my God, I I didn't even realize when this was it's one hour past when I was engaged in the storytelling or the way the performer was dancing. If your answer is so. Uh, Oh yes, that is it, it was beautiful because that will if the form and the technique and the work is genuine and honest, it will touch you somewhere. Instinctively you will realize immediately that yes, this is something I want to watch. The minute the answer is uh, this is what's going on. The classical has stopped being classical. It's I think it is and it is also I would unfortunately say that it is subjective because some people say I felt it was classical 
but then that comes thinking that yes this was classical comes a lot from that person's background how much is that person really engaged with the classical has he or she seen so much so many performances have they uh, expect have, have they first of all been trained so much have they spent time reading watching thinking so all these questions will answer their way the way they perceive a certain fusion or confusion you know it it all depends on that so i think it's a very very subjective performance but follow slightly follow your instincts and you you get that feel you know that no something wrong here can i begin okay um so i think breaks are very important at least for me because it gives me perspective to go back i'm sure in different fields all of us do take a break to really see uh, have a perspective understand a perspective so in bharatanatyam especially you know uh, for a long time it's also physically demanding at one point if you are doing back to back shows traveling everything um there was no time to sit back and breathe sometimes okay over my i i have taken a break now for some time now so it feels so beautiful for a long time i never knew what taking a break meant so then i mean people used to say pretty you can't be like this you're going to burn out you have to take a break uh but then i was like no no this is my age you know i have to like go ahead do and i like, gather as much experience as possible and all that but then when i when life really slowed me down organically it made a lot of sense as to what breaks can do you know probably if not for slowing down or taking a break i would just have been the same machine working in like going on and on and on without stopping and without uh, being able to answer some of the questions that some of you asked today if i am able to probably answer some of these it comes from a space of perspective that i engaged myself with and um i want to be honest i do not practice every day okay but riyas means different things to different people okay so for me riyas is even if i read if i so i my day cannot go without listening to music so for me the practice of listening to music is riyas in some way it does not always pertain to bharatanatyam to be able to do something repeat, uh, repeatedly but consciously or unconsciously but you go to it right so i look at riyas like that i am not i have never practiced bharatanatyam every day giving it time only for practice okay for a long time it was performance based or oh, there's a performance coming up there's a choreography i need to create it was very um, opportunity based but when i took a break i figured every day dancing is not my happy place okay i want to make it clear because it can be for somebody else because they've arrived at a space to discover that that is their understanding of riyas so even in a even in a class or workshop when people ask uh, how many hours do you practice a day i mean for a long time all of us have lifted hands because we might feel we are like we have to conform to the uh, topic and let's just not look like we are people who don't practice but i figured that for me riyas brightens up and sparks joy when i come back to dance only when there is a break there are times i have not thought about dance in a day or for few days also okay it's highly natural highly natural so at least for me i'm telling this from my uh, experience of breaks in uh, my career okay so yeah thank you <laughs>